I, I mean, I think we are on the threshold of a global community. We're obviously not there because we have wars, we have cold wars, and I think technology is kind of forcing us to decide whether we want to transcend this kind of conflict and function as a global community and and there thereby deal with some of the challenges that technology poses that I think can only be handled through international coordination and cooperation. Or alternatively, have very bad things happen. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with the creative thinker and visionary author, Robert Wright, who tackles big questions ranging from morality and religion to society and politics, often from an evolutionary perspective. Our conversation is part of Closer to the Truth series on the Noosphere at 100, the future of human collective consciousness. Closer to the Truth is partnering with human energy and celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Noosphere. Welcome, Bob. I've long wanted to explore with you the thematic arc of your remarkable intellectual journey um, as you reflect upon it. Well, I'm flattered that you're interested and and I'm looking forward to talking about it. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Great. Well, look, I want to begin with a very simple question. When I first saw you were participating in the Noah Spheres 100th anniversary, I, I was a little curious. I mean, what is it about your work? that has that that nexus um and it it was quite easy to discern i came up with a one word answer to that question i want to try it out on you and correct me if i'm wrong and the word i picked was teleology yeah i have written about teleology which maybe we should explain refers to purpose in this case the idea that maybe there's some larger purpose unfolding through evolution, through the evolution of the universe, whatever, which is a hypothesis I've taken more seriously than a lot of people who orient themselves in a fundamentally scientific framework, I'd say, uh, because I think the two are, are very compatible. I think you can talk seriously about the possibility of purpose while hanging on to your scientific credentials. Yeah, teleology used to be, even though it's a lot more than a four-letter word, it used to be the equivalent of a four-letter word in science. I think less so today for various reasons. Uh, maybe you have something to do with it, but um, sure. it really was a was a sort of a, a like a placeholder for theology. They both start with T, but uh, doesn't mean they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. I mean, theology often involves teleology, and and you know the the versions of higher purpose that we're most familiar with, that we've heard the most about, are religious in nature. But you also hear these days about the possibility that we're living in a simulation. And regardless of what you think of that, that would be an example of there being in some sense a purpose. Presumably the, the simulation was set up for something, if only the amusement of the person setting it up or the being setting it up or whatever set it up. Um, so it's certainly possible for something to be imbued with a purpose, uh, I mean, even the whole universe to be imbued with purpose by something other than a traditional God. Yeah, so theology then is a subset of teleology that all theology, at least I can think of, would, would have a te teleology. So all religion would be teological, but all theological would not have to be religious in the classical sense. I think that's right. I mean, offhand, I can't think of a religion that has a god or gods that don't, in some sense, involve a larger purpose that individual people are supposed to align themselves with. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so I think that that will be a, an important theme that I want to explore with you and how that works into um, into your into your intellectual arc as as you've developed it and. I think it's most richly developed in, in non-zero as, as a focal point, but I think it, it pervades your, your way of thinking, and I think that's fascinating. Uh, and, and there is definitely a, um, uh, a difference in approach. I mean, the word te teleology today in evolutionary discussions um, is coming back, but it's coming back you know, in a constrained way. But it used to be really uh, verboten in, in evolutionary studies. 
Yeah, and I think that's partly because of a kind of confusion. I think a lot of evolutionary biologists assume, even today, that if you talk about a larger purpose unfolding through evolution, you're talking about something other than, you know, Darwinian mechanics driving the process. And and more broadly, something beyond kind of material mechanics uh, driving the process. And, you know, a teleological evolution wouldn't have to involve any, you know, spooky forces, so to speak, any, any kind of mystical guiding forces, or like an Elan Vital, as Henri Bergson wrote about, for example. Um, you know, you, you can imagine, I mean, for example, suppose that extraterrestrials planted the first self-replicating material on planet Earth because they thought, well, through this process of natural selection, there's a pretty high probability of intelligence evolving, and then it will face these challenges, and that would be interesting to watch. Well, that would be a kind of teleology. It wouldn't involve departure from natural selection. Um, and I, I personally think it's uh, possible to kind of look at evolution and you know, adduce evidence to support the hypothesis of teleology, which isn't to say we can be sure uh, by any means on, sure. on the basis of, you know, empirical observations, whether this is a purposive uh, system. And, and that, that would mean sort of that evolution has a trophism. It, it's sort of a, uh, a directional pull, um, like a magnet in some, in some uh, uh ideological way, uh, that there's a directionality to evolution without any, making any commitments to uh, what's the reason for that. Yeah, the directionality is often a hallmark of purpose. Now, you use the word pull, and the pull-push distinction is, in a way, an important one. I mean, uh, construing those words in a certain way. Um, so, for example, I mean, let's take something that uh, we kind of know is in some sense imbued with purpose that's biological, which is to say an individual organism, right? I mean, natural selection imbues organisms with the goal of replicating their genes. Mm -hmm. You know, you might want to put purpose in quotes, and, and if you want to say organisms are designed to maximize genetic proliferation, you might want to put designed in quotes, but still, you know... Darwinian-oriented philosophers like Dan Dennett are comfortable using words like design and purpose, even though Dan does not agree uh, that evolution itself has a purpose. He's comfortable sure. talking about um, about uh, life, individual living forms as having a purpose. And you'll notice that they, they do have a direction. They mature, um, you know, they, they, they get more and more complex. Uh, they, they're... You know, with certain kinds of animals, they get, in a sense, smarter as, as their brains develop. Um, and then they do, uh, you know, behave as if they're pursuing certain goals that are subordinate to genetic proliferation, like eating or having sex or whatever. Um, so, yeah, direction can be a hallmark of purpose. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so, so the argument about whether evolution has a direction even in just a probabilistic sense, was it likely to produce more and more complex forms of life, likely even to produce a species as smart as humans, and therefore likely to lead to a kind of technological evolution, which brings us to the noosphere, of course, that, that all becomes relevant to any argument about whether evolution might have a purpose. The, the push-pull thing is like with an organism... You know, you would say, well, it's not it's not being pulled toward maturation. I mean, I mean, the material forces, the unfolding of the of the DNA and so on are, are kind of a pushing force. Right. It's causality yeah, moving internal. forward. Uh, so it's it's not being pulled quite like a, a magnet. And, and that's an important distinction, because if you make it sound like it's more of a magnet, then you will antagonize more evolutionary biologists. Yeah. Who naturally, you know, uh, view this as a fundamentally material kind of conventionally causal process, the unfolding itself, even if the unfolding was in some sense designed to realize a purpose, whether designed 
by a process like natural selection or de or designed in other cases by an, an intelligence. Right. And uh, you've antagonized a few anyway with, with your more, more modest approach. So I, go, I don't want to push you to, to antagonize more. Let me, let me do a, a, a more formal bio. Uh, Robert Wright is a content creator and media visionary. As a journalist, he was a senior editor at The New Republic and The Sciences. The Sciences was one of my all-time favorite magazines, maybe the favorite, uh, but it closed, like many other popular things I've, I've liked in life. Uh, Bob founded two important online intellectual video series, Meaning of Life TV and Bloggerheads TV. He has written five path-setting books, which will constitute the outline of my discussion with Bob's uh, and to understand his intellectual journey. The five are, and then we'll go through them, uh, three scientists and their gods is the first, looking for meaning in an age of information. Second, the moral animal, which um, had a large degree to popularize the concept of evolutionary psychology. Non-zero, the logic of human destiny, which will be the core of our conversation because it relates to the noosphere. The evolution of God got great publicity and, and his most recent book, why Buddhism is true uh, in a non, uh, shall we say, non-spiritual sense, but a more uh, materialistic sense. So those are the, uh, the five. And Bob, what I'd like to do is go through each, give me a, some sense. And again, we're going to focus on, on more on non-zero. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, three scientists and their gods. Uh, what, what's the theme of the book? Very quickly, then we'll move on. Well, it's a profile of three scientists or social scientists all of whose work involved some themes I explored, certainly including the processing of information in, in different uh, senses. Ed Wilson, who studied information processing in like ant societies. Um, Kenneth Boulding, a social scientist, was a third of them. And he actually was something of a fan of, of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's and the idea of the noosphere. So I got into that idea a little toward uh. the end of that. Uh, book, because, um, of course, you know, uh, the noosphere is certainly an information processing system, a kind of, you know, planetary mind or brain. Um, and uh, then the other scientist and the first one in the book was a guy named Ed Fredkin, who had this idea right. that, the, that 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 uh, we should view physics. He thought that the foundation of physics was actually kind of digital. And we are the universe is in some sense a computer um, and. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was three profiles, but I tried to impart some unity to it and it did end on questions of, of teleology. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Fredkin, uh, underappreciated, uh, in more recent times, uh, Stephen Wolfram has, uh, developed the, the idea of, of rules and digital rules being the foundation of, uh, of physics and, and reality. Uh, but Fredkin was, uh, was definitely a pioneer in that. Okay, let's move on to the moral animal, um, uh, why we are the way we are, and you subtitled the new science of evolutionary psychology. So uh, you asked some intriguing questions. Are men literally born, born to cheat and not monogamous? Uh, does monogamy serve women's interests? So you, you deal with a lot of very practical uh, um, uh, uh, issues in, in, in modern society, um, but looking and deeply at the concept of evolutionary psychology as being behind it all. Yeah, uh, that was early days in evolutionary psychology. The phrase wasn't that current then. Um, in fact, when I started working on the book, I wasn't aware of the phrase. Uh, I was aware right. of the ideas that the field rests on, some kind of refinements of the theory of uh, natural selection in a, in a sense, or extensions of the theory that helps explain things like altruism, sexual psychology in men and women, as you uh, suggested, uh, and uh, not just altruism toward Ken, although that was a fundamental insight as to how that had evolved, but also uh, more kind of conditional altruism we direct toward friends and the whole infrastructure of emotions that govern that, uh, which includes feelings like gratitude, um, you know, even feelings like resentment at being betrayed and, and, and so on. So I, I think uh, there were developments in biology, in, in, in theory, uh, during the 70s mainly, late 60s and 70s, that, that really gave us a deeper understanding into the whole landscape of human emotions. What are some practical examples of, of that? 
perhaps in in uh, uh, sexual selection? Well, in in the case of uh, sexual psychology, an example is is the pretty well documented fact that men are more readily aroused by sheerly visual stimuli. For example, you may have noticed that in all cultures, uh, pornography of that kind is overwhelmingly, you know, a male thing. Um, and issues of, well, differences in the nature of jealousy, for example. Um, so a lot of kind of practical applications. It, it This tends to get oversimplified. I want to emphasize that nothing is determined, you know, uh, and... Um, you know, for example, uh, the, there was an excerpt of the book on the cover of Time magazine and it said infidelity, it may be in our genes. I mean, that, you know, it's not inevitable. Um, but but yeah, I, I, a point in the book was there are uh, unfortunate and stubborn forces that we all have to wrestle with. Mm. Um, differentiate for me uh, the history of uh, sociobiology versus evolutionary psychology. Um, when I w was uh, uh, doing some work at MIT, that was uh, sociobiology, was the, the, which was in the late 1970s. Um, it, it, was, it was the hot area, and many people were you know, violently against it because the, what the implications were regarding you know, racial issues, a whole bunch of things, but uh, there was a, a, a lot of animosity that I felt uh, toward sociobiology, uh, perhaps missing some of the, the subtleties. Yeah, that word was coined by E.O. Wilson at Harvard. He wrote a huge book called Sociobiology in 1975. It made the cover of Time in 77 or 78, and, and, and the controversy kind of arose. Um, and you're right, he, he hadn't gotten into race at all, but he was accused uh, um, various things he, he hadn't gotten into at all. I think one reason the term evolutionary psychology re kind of replaced sociobiology yeah. is that sociobiology had acquired some of this kind of unfortunate baggage, fairly or unfairly, often unfairly. Um, and evolutionary psychology, as I think of it, is about the kind of universal human nature. In other words, the the kind of genetic substratum of our nature that is common to all people everywhere. Yes, there are individual genetic differences between me and my neighbor, between races and so on, but that's not really the the uh, the the point of interest to me. And behavioral genetics is the field that that studies the significance of genetic differences. Um, evolutionary psychology, as I see it, is more about what we all have in common. The one exception being that that uh, there are acknowledged differences, again, between, you know, for example, sexual psychology between uh, men and women. Uh, the In recent times, uh, evolutionary psychology has come in for a, a lot of criticism in its own right, even, even, even having shed the baggage of the sociobiology uh, uh, issue. Um, I've been surprised, as we've done some focusing on philosophy of biology, to see the uh, the, the criticisms of it, and I think I think it, it, it boils down to the 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 charge that it is uh, that it's over, it's an oversimplification that there are just so stories you can tell a story that sounds right, but just because it sounds right doesn't mean it is right, and and doesn't exclude a you know a welter of alternatives. Yeah, and, and it's actually true that um, it's it's a. Uh... You know, a lot of hypotheses start out as just so stories, right? Yeah. Well, maybe the reason male jealousy tends to differ from female jealousy in this way is because of this. Yeah. Uh, but then there are there are ways to test these theories and make them less and less just so stories. In general, explaining evolutionary adaptations, whether they're human psychological tendencies that are in the genes, or whether they're the like the functionality of the whiteness of a polar bear are not that easy to test. It's like, it's like a good story. Well, maybe polar bears, yeah. you know, they fit in with their background. They live in the snow, <laughs> but you know, strictly speaking, it's just a story. And then you look for ways to test this, for example, drill down on the correlation. Are there any polar bears that live in the jungle? Are there, you know, you, you can, you can always go further. Evolutionary psychologists have tried to come up with good tests to test the theories, 
But, you know, it's not like physics where you can just run these experiments that settle the matter. There are yeah. kinds of experiments you can run that may corroborate a theory to some extent or another, like hooking men and women up to various uh, things that monitor their physiological status as they imagine their mates cheating on them or something, and that kind of stuff is done. But it's hard to come up with experiments that are as definitive as, as experiments in, in physics. Of course, that's the nature of the hierarchy of science. As you go higher and higher in complexity, the, the certainty of the approach and the experimental design gets more complicated, and, and we, we, we all have to be uh, uh, careful. All right, let's and, move and on. And it's the nature of an historical explanation. It's like, sure. it's like we're arguing that the reason X is the a feature of some animal is something that happened a long time ago. Right. And there's always a possibility, and you brought yeah, it up, yeah. of, of, a, of a spandrel, which means that something that looks like it really exists in architecture right. is really because other things have been there that that sort of looks like it's a something, but it's really not a something. And a spandrel would be something that evolved because it was related to something else, which did uh, was selected for, and the spandrel just came along for the ride. Right. All right, let's move on to non-zero, which is uh, a, really a, a fascinating a way of thinking that uh, that you've developed, um, and uh, let, let's let, let's understand what it what it what it is, what non-zero is, uh, uh, the um, the and the use that you've used of uh, game theory, um, the concept of uh, of um, non-zero sumness, uh, the prospect of creating new interactions. Uh, let, let, let's just get an overall concept of the of the core theme. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the book is devoted to, in a sense, explaining how we got from the state of the world 15,000 years ago, when the most complex society was a hunter gatherer society to the age of the noosphere, in a sense, where we have, you know, globally connected human beings uh, who, who can communicate uh, around the world in in real time and so on. And the game theory comes in in the way I kind of explain that. So a non-zero-sum game, of course, is is one that doesn't have to have a winner and a lo or and a loser. It can have two winners, two losers. Um, and the argument put in perhaps too simple form is that uh, the reason social complexity has grown in expanse and depth we get these more and more complicated societies until we finally get to globalization, you know, larger and more complex societies until we get to globalization, um, is that new technologies come along that either facilitate the playing of non-zero-sum games, transportation technologies that let people trade, communications technologies, um, or encourage the playing of non-zero-sum games in other ways. So, for example, even the technologies of war encourage non-zero-sum coordination within each society. They intensify the incentive for cooperation within the society. So, anyway, the the uh, I follow that theme through the book and and depict uh, you know the 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 movement from hunter-gatherer society to giant global brain. Uh, to a point where we're on the verge of a global community, although we're, we're not there yet, uh, of course, and there's a lot more uh, conflict in the world than I like to see. But I, I do try to explain that by reference to the way uh, technologies have kind of altered the game theoretical opportunities and incentives. And I argue that it was very likely to, to happen the, the, the driving force was very strong, given human nature and, and human inventiveness. And then I also back up and make a comparable argument about biological evolution, which can be depicted as an interplay of zero-sum and non-zero-sum forces. And I argue that, you know, that, that interplay has driven uh, biological organization from kind of Simple cell, the complex cell, multi-celled organisms, societies of multi-celled organisms. And there, too, I argue, although it has to be more speculative there, I think, but I argue that you can make a case that that impetus, too, was strong enough such that there was a pretty high likelihood of getting a species as smart as humans. So, you know, if you step back and view it all, then then you uh, I'm arguing that, you know, given the 
the first seed of life on this planet, there was a pretty good chance you'd wind up uh, with a giant globe of rain. <laughs> you know, and, and that, uh, to oversimplify a bit, a bit um, that does raise the question of teleology. Uh, and, and, yeah, and that's what um, uh, many, many people have, uh, many scientists have uh, find, uh, although they, they love your work and praise it, that's the point that they, 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 get, they get queasy and don't want to go along for, for that part of the ride. Yeah. Um, they, uh, sometimes because they misunderstand what I'm saying, sometimes not. Uh, there's a conversation between me and Daniel Dennett on YouTube I'd encourage people to check out where we kind of argue about this. He seems to kind of concede that there's a case. He later said he didn't mean to do that. But in any event, uh, it it illuminates the issues. Uh, uh, do you see it in the past as as gradualism or a series of step functions? Uh, not necessarily the punctuated equilibrium of Gould. Went to, uh, but um, in, in terms of this developmental process, um, and then specifically now or in the future, as you're developing this global brain, as you discuss it, and that's part of the noosphere, is that a step function? Is that it, 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 when you have enough uh, gradual change, is that suddenly you yield uh, a, uh, a qualitative change? Well, I do think there are big thresholds that are passed through, I mean, kind of obvious ones in some cases, like the transition from uh, single cell to multicellular life. And there, you know, as far as the argument for directionality goes, it becomes relevant that that has actually been invented by natural selection multiple times, right? Separate transitions to uh, multi, multi-celled life. And, and so too for a lot of other uh, kind of impressive evolutionary invention. So, so there are thresholds and there, and so too with human history, you know, there, there are periods where not much seems to be happening. Then all of a sudden a particular invention will make a big difference like the printing press. Um, so it does, things do proceed in fits and starts. Uh, but the, the overall drift, I think has a pretty clear direction. And now, as you're looking to this global brain noosphere, is is, is the the internet, for example, is that the the uh, triggering technology? It's been a triggering technology, and I think you know artificial intelligence is going to be another big disruptive and, in some sense, transformational thing. I hope in a good way. Um, you know, and I, I feel this this is, I think the moment we're at is, uh, you know, a, a very momentous one. Um, maybe, uh, and, you know, kind of epic. I mean, I, I mean, I think we are on the threshold of a global community. We're obviously not there because we have wars. We have cold wars. And I think technology is kind of forcing us to decide whether we want to transcend this kind of conflict and function as a global community and and there thereby deal with some of the challenges that technology poses that I think can only be handled through international coordination and cooperation or alternatively have very bad things happen. Yeah, and this is, again, you, you could argue that, uh, you know, Wow, if if indeed the whole system has been moving toward this moment, and it's a moment uh, with a kind of a moral dimension, which it has, I think, because I think we need to um, transcend the the kind of less fortunate parts of ourselves if we're going to make this work. You might argue that that's that that's part of an argument for teleology. That it's a it's a different kind of argument from some, and you you might you might disagree that it's any kind of argument at all but it's interesting to me that as i see it the system has been moving pretty inexorably toward this kind of moment of truth where either we move closer towards something that i think actually deserves the term enlightenment uh not not in a spooky mystical sense just in the sense of um people having a a clearer view of reality that is less warped by egoistic biases and, and group, you know, tribal biases, kind of. Bob, if we were having this conversation, say, 10 years ago, uh, the concept of increasing globalization, uh, 
granted there are still conflicts, uh, would, would have seemed uh, uh, understandable. But from standpoint today, at least from the, the snapshot of the world that, we, uh, that we've been living in recently, uh, it, it really seems like we're going the other way. It does seem that way uh, at the moment. Um, and, you know, I think fundamentally the problem is, is human nature and uh, the challenge is to, in some sense, transcend the more unfortunate parts of it. I mean, you know, conflicts are very diverse uh, superficially. Conflicts among nations uh polarization within nations, cold wars, hot wars. But I think they tend to involve the same pretty limited set of cognitive biases that that warp our perspective. And I think it, we understand these biases now. It's just that they're very stubborn and subtle and tricky and hard to overcome. Um, and... I think that's our mission as a species. I mean, I think, you know, right now, I mean, with AI, for example, I I feel, you know, we're we're not, it reminds me of like giving a driver's license to a 13 year old. It's an extremely powerful technology. And I just don't think that right now we're ready for it. That's what worries me. Mm. Um, you make the point, and uh, I, I personally believe that uh, social media is, be, is a, uh, a dominant feature, which uh, in an idealistic world would create the noosphere and the global consciousness and all that. But in the real world, it's causing more problems, at least on that specter. And th- th- this was uh, told to me at a time um by um one of the great um great thinkers of our of, of a modern times so marvin minsky uh and this was in 1999 it was actually the very first close to the truth uh, uh, uh program where everybody at that time the internet was you know a, a few years old and everybody was so excited it was going to uh, homogenize the world and everything and marvin said he said no he said the opposite is going to happen. Uh, like-minded people are going to congregate in smaller and smaller groups, and we will become more divided. Everybody disagreed with him, including me, because we were so enamored with what the Internet could do. And he used a wonderful story. I've told it a few times. But he said, he said one of my uh, 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 quirks is that I'm an aficionado, this is Marvin Minsky talking, yeah. of cat, cat whiskers, the whiskers that come out of cats and what they are and different ways of, uh, of uh, categorizing them. And he said, you know, there are about 50 people in the whole wide world who are uh, cat whisker aficionados. And I now know them and we have this group and we spend our time talking about cat whiskers. And that was the example he used as a trivial example of what would happen in the future in terms of politics, religion, etc., which would have serious consequences on, on humanity. Um, and I think that's what's happening. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, so that was in 1999. It was at the very end of 1999 that my book Non-Zero came out. And I, and I talked about this problem uh, because, it, you know, we had seen it before with the printing press. I mean, whenever you make powerful information communication technology available to more and more people and it's cheaper and cheaper, you can expect narrower interest groups to form. I mean, for starters, after the printing press, the church broke up between Catholic and Protestant. Um, uh, the printing press played a big role in the form of dis- in formation of distinct national identities. And the hope I expressed in non-zero is that although some of these tribal lines would be narrower, they might be greater in scope. So they would cross national bounds Yes. Uh, sometimes in ways that might be constructive. You might get labor unions organizing more effectively, internationally, whatever. Um, and so ultimately you could have, you know, kind of global sinews of a new kind that ultimately held things together. And I don't think that's out of the question still, but uh, it it's a challenge. And, and I don't think many people anticipated the way social media would intensify the challenge, the way if companies 
could build these algorithms designed to maximize engagement, yeah. um, they would kind of bring out the worst in us, you know, right. uh, but they have. And, and, and that's something we're kind of wising up to, but it's still happening. It's still, it's a very stubborn thing. And, um, you know, it, it's one of the challenges we face. I mean, all these technologies have great potential to form new kinds of bonds internationally and globally. But they also, um, you know, can intensify tribal conflict, and they're doing a lot of that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the that's the 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 crux of, of the issue. Um, I, I love the idea of labor unions across uh, borders having similar ideas. Uh, uh, closer to truth, we uh, started out ninety nine percent in the U S. and we're now down to you know barely over forty percent. Sixty percent is outside the U S. and mm -hmm. much from the uh, the Muslim world, uh, from Iran and yep. Turkey and various places. Uh, and, and we love that because people who are interested in these kinds of questions transcend national borders. Uh, and that's, that's very encouraging. But what's not encouraging to me, um, is that all of these reasons we should be communicating with each other across national barriers are absolutely swamped by uh, the, the concept of nationalism, my tribe. Um, I follow U.S.-China relations uh, very carefully in my other world, um, and I see that dramatically. Um, and in many of the conflicts around the world, that, 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 that the tribal instinct of, of nationalism, however you define your group, normally today by the nation state, but it can be uh, racial or um, uh, or uh, an ethnicity. It's in fact ethnicity is probably the biggest one. And normally ethnicity is the nation state, but sometimes, like with the Kurds, it's across multiple uh, states. That that is uh, overwhelmingly uh, more powerful than all the other glorious ways we could communicate together. I mean, that's my pessimistic day talking, but I'd love to get your thinking on that. Yeah, the. Um... I mean, sometimes you actually see whether this is good or not is another question. But you see, first of all, polarization within nations, uh, as you're seeing in the U.S., and correspondingly, to some extent, actually, the internationalization of the different tribes. I mean, you know, Trump supporters are kind of more in touch with ethno-nationalists and other nations and so on. And of course, they think of their opponents in America as being these cosmopolitan elites who precisely because they feel they have more in common with elites in other countries than with middle Americans. Global globalists. Yeah, globalists. <laughs> uh, and so you are kind of seeing some of what I described. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, sinews across national borders. And it's possible for that to assume benign form. But for the time being, <laughs> that's not the form it's assuming. Um, and in particular, we're not seeing uh, the development of more effective global and international institutions. If anything, the opposite is happening uh, because, you know, some of these, the people I just described are very much kind of opposed to uh, global uh, and international Institution. So it's all very challenging. I mean, a, bi a big part of the problem in general, whether it's nation against nation or tribe within tribe, tribe against tribe within nation, is the way le people can elevate their stature and power by appealing to the the, the tribalistic yes, yes. impulses. So so American presidents can say China's a huge threat. China can do the same. Uh, leaders in red state America can say blue state America's horrible and, and leaders in blue state America can say the same. And I think social media is, has, if anything, exacerbated this, sure. made it uh, more and more, it seems, the easiest way to gain followers on social media is to demonize another tribe. And... Um, and, you know, this is just a fundamental problem that we're going to have to overcome because the, we're fragmenting along all possible lines almost right now, you know, intranational and international. Um, and that's not good.
and the fra- and the fragments are congealing in their own right and becoming harder and and tougher to uh, in resisting uh, uh, other other forces. So uh, we're not going to stop we're not going to solve that problem, but I think it's something that we all really need to be extremely cognizant of in, in a very real sense. Actually, my latest book, uh, Why Buddhism Is True, has some relevance to this. I spend a certain amount of time in that on the psychology of tribalism and the way mindfulness meditation can in principle help erode that psychology. I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. We've all heard of confirmation bias now, this tendency to seize on to information that supports your pre-existing kind of ideological preference and reject information that doesn't. And, you know, Buddhist psychology has long recognized something that's uh, becoming more and more apparent to Western psychology, I'd say, which is how finely intertwined emotions and cognition are. And these so-called cognitive biases are a good example where feelings play a big role and in principle meditation uh, can help us deal with those feelings. So confirmation bias, you know, you see something on social media that confirms your worldview. If you pay close attention, if you in a certain sense are mindful, you may notice that makes you feel good. You you actually have affection for the information. Yeah. And the idea of sharing it makes you feel good. Yeah. You, you have an urge to retweet or share, right? And, and similarly, if it's something that, that, that seems to work against, evidence that seems to work against your worldview, it's like you, you can feel an aversion to it. You don't like it. And you want to you want to destroy it. You want you want to find something wrong with it. You're not interested in things that might confirm it. You're interested in things that undermine it. Those will make you feel good. So it's it's all about feelings. And one thing mindfulness meditation should do when it works, regular mindfulness meditation, is make it a little easier to be aware of those things. So you're on social media, you see something, it makes you feel some way, and ideally you'll go, well, wait a second, uh, should I be a slave to my feelings or should I just try to be a rational being? You know, it'll give you that second to reflect. So, um, you know, I do think this is an example of a technique. It's not the only technique that can help us try to overcome some of these cognitive biases that help drive the psychology of tribalism. Yeah, I, I think the book is a, a fascinating exploration of the, uh, the uh, really the psychoanalysis of ourselves through the lens of, of, of Buddhism uh, in a non-transcendental um, spiritual reincarnation sense, but in a very practical sense and resonating with the uh, the fundamental basis of, of our mentality. I think that's wonderful. But frankly, um, I, I like what you're saying, but, but, you know, you're making me more pessimistic because we're going to rely upon, you know, the entire world be doing mindful mindfulness meditation. You know, I think we're in bigger trouble than I thought. Well, I mean, the good news is that a lot of people find mindfulness meditation just has straightforward benefits, therapeutic benefits. They do it because it makes them feel better, reduces their anxiety level or whatever. So you get some of that. Uh, but look, I'm not saying the challenge is not steep. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. I, I'm I'm worried. <sighs> okay. Well, we're, we're certainly aligned on that, on the worry. Uh, let's go back to um, non-zero. Uh, obviously, you do not uh, espouse and oppose you know, vigorously uh, any sort of uh, theistic evolution, or certainly creationism in any sense whatsoever. But you uh, you leave the door open to a teleology or maybe even some sort of a, a divine aspect uh, to it. And the 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 evidence that you use in that is not evolution, but rather the existence of consciousness, which is a, a particular area that I've uh, f- been focusing on. Uh, why do you say that? Why do you, uh, as opposed to the vast majority of, of neuroscientists, et cetera, and, and most philosophers, uh, that there's really nothing so special about consciousness uh, that would um, that would that would even give you a hint of some uh, non-physical uh, intervention. Yeah, um, I, I got into this a little in non-zero. Um, the basic idea is just that you know whatever your theory of consciousness, you probably agree that it's it 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 exists in in the sense that. It is like something to be alive. We have subjective experience, pleasure, pain. There are are people 
who seem not to who, who are basically arguing that consciousness doesn't exist. There, that is a school of philosophy. I still don't understand what they're talking about, but it's yeah. out there. I should note. Um, and I've had dialogues with them online on videos and, and, and so on. But most people would say, look, yeah, there's pleasure, there's pain, there's happiness or sadness. And I think they would also say that's what gives life meaning. And right. If you imagine a planet full of people who behave as as complexly as we do, they even use language, which, after all, is fundamentally material. Sound waves go in the ear. They trigger a bunch of physical stuff in the brain that then leads to a response, which is itself sound waves. You can describe everything we do in physical terms. And so you can imagine uh, beings without consciousness. But if you imagine them, you're imagining a planet where there just isn't much meaning, right? Like if I said, well, I'm going to go destroy one of these creatures on this planet, you'd probably say, yeah, well, whatever. It's not, there's no meaning on the planet. You're not denying them any future joy or anything or, or making any other beings there sad. What does it matter? So we have this amazing thing that gives life meaning. And interestingly, it seems to get more and more complex as biological evolution proceeds. If you assume, as I do, that like other animals have it, just not as complex. It's like something to be my dog, I think. He has pleasure and pain and so on. Um and this is actually something that Teilhard de Chardin noted, although he he had his own, uh, you know, view of consciousness that wouldn't be widely accepted uh, in in Darwinian circles. He was right to see evolution as, in some sense, uh, the ascent of consciousness to to the extent that evolution naturally produces more complex beings, which it doesn't always do, but. You know, it does it enough that over time, the most complex being gets more and more complex in the long run over evolutionary time. Um, so, you know, if evolution is indeed in some sense a machine for generating more complex forms of consciousness and therefore a machine for generating more and more meaningful life, you know, if we agree that consciousness is what gives life meaning, well, that's just the kind of thing that that one could use as evidence that there's in some sense a larger purpose unfolding, uh, even of the kind that we associate with divine purpose, right? Uh, so uh, it's not just a physical structural kind of directionality. It's a directionality of meaning. So that's that's what I'd say about that. And it doesn't matter whether you think consciousness is a mere epiphenomenon, that it has the relationship to our, our brain that a shadow, the shadow of my hand has to my hand. Maybe it does. It still gives my life meaning. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think that is not often enough marveled at, this fact that, uh, that, that life is meaningful for reasons we don't totally understand because nobody has a truly satisfactory explanation of why consciousness exists at all. I think that's absolutely true. But I think I read in uh, one of the reviews of The Evolution of God, and you had you know, a lot of super reviews, but there was a quote that said, Something like this is that there is something here to annoy almost everyone. Uh, I think you would take that as a compliment. Uh, explain to me why that's true. Um, I mean, it kind of reminds me of something an editor said when I, when we were kind of, you know, I, I had a book proposal. Um, it was it was something to the effect that well, uh. You know, there are people who would agree with you that religion evolves in this way, which I won't get into, but but fundamentally as kind of a response to material forces on the ground, changes in social structure and so on. And then there are people who would agree with you that maybe there is a larger purpose unfolding. But there aren't many people who believe both. That's all right. And I kind of thought, well, maybe that's a reason you shouldn't buy this book. It sounds like nobody's, you know, everybody is going to have something to hate about it. But, but that I, that's one thing uh, I think that could mean. Uh, yeah, th there aren't that many people who agree with me entirely here. No. And, and the fact that they don't agree with one of the sides, is that more of a dominating factor than the part they agree with? What have you found? Well, I don't know. I guess I would just say that, I mean, the view of religion, 
I put forth could be construed as a kind of a cynical view of religion, right? Like um, in ancient Israel, um, you know, politicians arguing for allegiance to one God because that will increase their power. And so, and, you know, struggles among gods as, as reflecting power struggles on the ground. It's a very cynical, some would say, view of how religion uh, evolves. And people who hold that are generally like Marxist atheists or something, right? And um, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Which, which of these two constituencies is more annoyed by the book? <laughs> um, it's different kinds of annoyance, uh, I guess. I don't know. And and with the, and and from the standpoint of the person being annoyed, why are they annoyed by what they disagree with rather than being elated with what they agree with? Well, uh, the Marxist atheist or the libertarian atheist uh, might not would would would. Well, you mean why are they focusing on what they're annoyed by? That well, that's the way I live my life. I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time talking about things. Right, that are we do. I, I, we're, we agree on that. Question is why? Yeah, uh, why are people like that? Um, look, I, I, I will say I, 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 uh, I, I got some warm embraces from both sides as well. Some people yeah. who just focused on, you know, actual Marxists, for example, who said, "Yeah, this is a very compelling view of the way religion has evolved." On the other hand, you know, Bill Moyers, uh, who, who, by the way, is an actual ordained uh, minister, I think, uh, you know, had me on a show that did a world of good for the book. He's a he's a Christian. Um, and I mean, he is something of a lefty. Uh, and and uh, but um, uh, so I, I got, you know, some some people were nice to me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we've had on Closer to Truth uh, praise from both atheistic and theistic websites. They say kind of ignore the other stuff, but th this part is very good. And right. my favorite is in one video that we had, the the, the comments on YouTube, uh, one person said that Kuhn is a closet theist trying to convert the unconverted. And about 15 comments later, someone said Kuhn's a, a secret atheist trying to disabuse uh, religious people of their belief. Uh, sure. So we, we like that. That's good. Keep them guessing. <laughs> um, final question on evolution of, of God is, uh, is religion a spandrel or is it generated it, when it, you say it's generated by these materialistic forces mm -hmm. in politics and, and society? Does that make it a spandrel? It, it is in the sense that I don't think it's a biological adaptation. I mean, there are people who believe that there's kind of a genetic basis for religious belief per se uh. that evolved because it's conducive to group cohesion or something. That's not the way I describe it. I actually address in a, in this in a kind of appendix to the book, um, the question of how we came to be, you know, being susceptible to religious in the first place. Um, and I, I think it, it, it's a um, there, there are a number of human tendencies that are built into the genes that lead to supernatural belief, religious belief, and that cultural evolution kind of weaves that into a coherent uh, whole that you could call a religion that becomes more and more of an institutional thing, although it's not now for everyone. I mean, there, uh, but but uh, so it's, I, I would say it's not a biological adaptation. At a, at a biological level, it's a spandrel. You could argue that at a cultural level, um, it has adaptive, it, it often has adaptive properties. It does, it does often help societies cohere. Okay. We're going to conclude with, I'm going to throw out some terms, all of which we've talked about one way or the other. And I'd like to, for you to give me a very, very short answer. One sentence is maximum. One, one word would even be fine. So the first one is, is there ultimate meaning and purpose? Probably as one could defensibly define ultimate human destiny in the sense that it is the destiny of a uh, poppy seed to grow toward being a mature poppy. Yes. Religion. What about it? 
<laughs> and, 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 give give me a one word or one sentence oh. summation. Mm. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, let's That's see. Good. Uh, whoa, whoa, well, okay, whoa, whoa, I'll, I'll, whoa, whoa, I'll go with William James. I'll, I'll go with the William James version. It's uh, the belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme interest lies in harmoniously aligning ourselves with it. Okay, next. Why are you critical of organized atheism? I'm only critical of the form of it that mistakenly, in my view, believes that religion is the root of superficially religious conflicts. Yeah. Morality, is it absolute or relative? I believe that there is such a thing as moral truth. Uh, evolutionary psychology or overview now, uh, you know, two decades after uh, exploring it? More. Um, how do I assess its current state? Yep. It hasn't progressed as far as I'd like, in part because of what I think is an undue focus on just mating and sex and stuff. And why are there so many conflicts in the world, given the um, philosophical overview that you espouse? I think the, the, the Buddha was right, and the reason we suffer and make other people suffer, and that includes conflicts, is because we don't see the world clearly. The future of the noosphere. The noosphere will either mature and cohere, or things will look very bad for our species. Well, we'd like to think that closer to truth and the work that you've done, Bob, over the years in your in your blogging and your book, uh, um, exemplify the noosphere and uh, will will help its more positive aspects. Many thanks, Bob. I love their conversation. Any one of these points, I could have gone on forever. Uh, viewers can watch uh, um, the hundreds, if not thousands, of videos on many of these topics, especially consciousness, on the Closer to Truth website and Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Uh, we deal with uh, all aspects of the nature of brain, mind, free will, personal identity, panpsychism, dualism, idealism, parapsycho, all of these kinds of subjects, all infused with critical thinking. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.